Yes, thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. We will now proceed. Uh, and now we will have the first speaker, which will be Ms. Martine Durand, Ch Chief Statistician of the OECD, who will be delivering the first speech for today. Please greet her with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to present to you today the report of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress, together with Professor Stiglitz and Professor Fitusi. Here are the um, reports. Um, you can download them from the uh, internet site of the OECD. They will be available uh, in book format uh, only at the end of um, next week. So, uh, the Secretary General uh, apologizes um, that he cannot participate in this presentation as he had to return to Paris for an urgent and unforeseen uh, meeting. Let me tell you a little bit about the high-level expert group. Uh, it's what we can call uh, Joe Jean-Paul, perhaps the successor of the Stiglitz and um, Fitusi Commission, or sometimes called also SSF. Um, five years ago, when uh, Professor Stiglitz and Professor um, Fitusi told me that they actually, um, they and some members of the SSF Commission uh, were looking for a place to continue the work of the Commission, I suggested to the OECD Secretary General that actually the OECD was a natural home to host this new independent group, and he immediately agreed to it. So I would really like to thank Joe Stiglitz and Jean-Paul Fitoussi for their commitment in bringing this work forward. They have tr actually traveled thousands of miles across the world to participate to the various meetings and workshops organized by the high-level group and have provided leadership and direction to this work. Let me also take this opportunity to thank the members of the group, the other members of the group, and some of whom are actually present with us today, Professor Francois Bourguignon, Professor Enrico Giovannini, Walter Rademacher, Ravi Kanbur, Professor Ravi Kanbur, Professor Jakob Hacker, who are with us today for having shared their insights and expertise on a variety of topics. Well, the OECD was a natural place to host such as, uh, such as a, an eminent group because, as you know, it has been at the forefront of the development of well-being metrics since 2004 when we organized the first World Forum in Palermo, as was mentioned in the opening session. We also contributed to the work of the uh, SSF Commission and have since been playing a critical role in implementing, actually, the Commission's recommendations at, at, at the international level. As you know, since 2011, we've been publishing our flagship publication, House Life, which measures uh, well-being along the 11 dimensions ranging from jobs, health, education, as recommended by the SSF Commission. We have also developed our Better Life Index, that allows citizens to attribute weight to those 11 dimensions according to their preferences and thus create their own measure of well-being. I should say that more than 11 million people have visited the BLI site since uh, its creation. And what the results show is that the BLI users value much more than just GDP, which too often contributes to re continues to remain the single compass used to guide policy decisions. For instance, BLI users put a lot of weight on health, skills, and subjective well-being. So the report we're launching today consists of two volumes that I just showed, <coughs> a volume of authored chapters by some members of the high-level group. It's called For Good Measure. Here, it's red. For good measure, advancing research on well-being metrics beyond GDP. As I said, authored by some members of the high-level group. And another volume called Beyond GDP, measuring what counts for economic social performance, 
which is represents an overview by the co-chairs on the work that has been carried out over the um, last five years. The report doesn't say do not use GDP, it says use GDP for what it is meant for, i.e. measuring the production of goods and services and the average income it generates over a given period of time. And use it as part of a dashboard of indicators. That dashboard has to reconcile two conflicting criteria. It has to present enough information to give a realistic picture of a country's health while not overwhelming the intended users with too many indicators. The report also stresses that we have to go beyond averages if we really want to understand whether most people are doing well or not. As Joe Stiglitz and Jean-Paul Fitoussi will, I'm sure, point out, this is not just a theoretical debate. We've already seen how ignoring inequalities can have serious political consequences. For example, in the aftermath of the crisis, governments often boasted that things were getting better because real GDP was growing. But many citizens, however, were seeing no improvement in their conditions, and in some cases, even their situation was getting worse. This led to misguided policies and in turn to a loss of trust in governments, institutions, and in experts. We therefore have a duty to promote measurement that reflects the reality of people's lives, to support policies that strive for well-being for all. The work presented and discussed in the two volumes by the high-level group addresses questions raised by the financial crisis and the Great Recession, including economic insecurity and the permanent destruct destruction of wealth, both phenomena not currently well captured by our statistical system. The report also takes stock of progress made since the SSF in measuring income and wealth inequalities, as well as sustainability and subjective well-being, noting though that more still needs to be done. But it also discusses the need to develop new metrics in areas that were not covered in the SSF report, such as inequalities of opportunities, inequalities within the household, economic insecurity, resi resilience, and trust. The report contains a set of 12 recommendations to move the statistical agenda forward. These recommendations include urging the international community to invest in upgrading the statistical infrastructure of poor countries, allowing statistical offices to use tax records to capture development in the top end of the distribution, integrating in, uh, information on inequalities in macroeconomic statistics to understand who benefits from GDP growth, and so on. Finally, the report also addresses the issue of anchoring the new indicators in policy making from diagnostic to policy design, implementation, monitoring, <coughs> and evaluation. As with the SSF report, the OECD stands ready to contribute to the implementation of these recommendations. We are currently in the process of reviewing our framework of our well-being framework that has underpinned our House Life Report and BLI indicator. So we will certainly take into account the recommendations included in the reports. We will also continue to use the well-being metrics in our policy work as we have done, for example, in the OECD framework for policy action on inclusive growth. And we will continue to strive to feed this work into our policy advice and analysis to guide countries towards a more inclusive and sustainable well-being. So I'm now very happy to give the floor to Professor Stiglitz to present the report in more details and then to Jean-Paul Fitoussi to actually comment on some of the findings in the report. So, Joe, I give you the floor. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, the, re the our original commission on the measurement of economic performance uh, and social progress uh, was issued just uh, under a decade ago and we were very pleased at uh, the, the response uh, of the international community to that report. Uh, I think it took us uh, all by a little bit of surprise. It was the right moment uh, where 
people realized that uh, the focus on GDP had really led uh, many of our societies to go in the wrong direction. And uh, that's the first point I, I, I want to emphasize that I, I is now increasingly understood that the economy is a means to an end and the end that we're all concerned with is the well-being uh, of the citizens and the strength of our communities. Uh, one of the aspects where it's been, I think, uh, particularly uh, 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 pleased of the re reception is from the statistical offices that wanted to take this idea and put them into, uh, uh, into, into numbers, but also from treasuries. Uh, I was just down in New Zealand where the Minister of Finance uh, is incorporating the idea of well-being measures into their budget allocation. So the, these ideas are actually uh, finding uh, the, uh, applicability in actual policy, which of course was part uh, of our intent. Uh, when we finished the report, we were very aware that we had just begun uh, touching the surface uh, of the topics. And, uh, you know, we emphasized a couple of points, what you measure ma affects what you do, uh, that if you measure the wrong thing, you do the wrong thing. Uh, but we were also, and, and we were very aware how, of the importance of uh, talking about the environment, uh, talking about inequality. But there were a large number of topics that we had not been able uh, to, uh, <coughs> dig, to dig deeper into. And uh, at the beginning uh, of the work of, uh, of the high-level expert group, the question was, among all these various possible uh, topics that we could go into, uh, what were the ones that we were going to devote uh, our time? And we had a limited amount of resources. Uh, the OECD was very generous. Uh, but uh, we wish it could have been wealthier so it could have been more <laughs> generous. Uh, and and uh, so we had uh, uh, both limited uh, uh, financial and human resources. Um, and we decided to focus uh, in, in on about uh, seven, eight topics which are reflected in the individual chapters. Uh, one of our experiences in the commission was getting uh, a broad consensus on any topic is uh, very difficult. Uh, we can get broad, I, mean, I shouldn't, it's not impossible, but uh, we decided it was easier, better, to have authored chapters so that the author would take into account the views of the other experts, but he would take responsibility for what was said. And then we would accompany that by a chairman's attempt to summarize what we thought was a, a review, uh, a, a, an overview of the broad, as a consensus of the workings uh, of the of the expert group. Uh, among the topics that we uh, narrowed onto were issues uh, like uh, how do we measure insecurity? Uh, how do we talk about um, uh, inequalities in all the dimensions, uh, opportunity, uh, horizontal as well as vertical inequalities. Uh, how do we talk about trust? Uh, and so part of what was going on as we uh, went forward in our work <coughs> was to try to be sensitive to what had happened in the world around us after the uh, work of uh, uh, the Commission on Measurement of Economic Performance, uh, and what had happened, you might say, in the broader intellectual uh, community. So there were a couple of things that really were very important. We have one chapter. The, the role of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, had meant that the whole world was focused on these large numbers of metrics of, uh, uh, and then the question is how did that relate to our uh, benchmark, uh, our, our dashboard approach. Uh, the global warming had become 
an even bigger issue. It was a big issue when we, uh, we wrote a report. It was becoming an even bigger issue. And so we, we decided we needed an, uh, another chapter, uh, more work on that. And uh, probably uh, for many of us really important was the global uh, economic downturn. And um, let me just say uh, at, at the end, and I think uh, Jean-Paul will, will amplify this, uh, a, a few words about uh, the, what our work and the work of the earlier commission and uh, response to the uh, global recession. But before t turning to there, I want to, to highlight uh, a, a couple of other more general points. Uh, the first I, I already said is that um, one of the important aspects of uh, this activity was the focus <coughs> on well-being as opposed to GDP, taking the emphasis of, uh, and, and that was one of the reasons that President Sarkozy uh, uh, initiated the commission was because he said, you know, I'm going to be graded by how well I do on GDP, but that's not what our citizens care about. They care about a lot of other things. And it would be nice that there were, wasn't a dissonance between the two. The second thing is a strong belief that uh, having measures really do affect behavior. Part of the reason that having measures is important is it enables us to assess what is going on, but it also enables us to do research. Research is important because we want to know how do we perform better in the things that we care about. So if we care about uh, uh, security, how do we produce more security? If we care about a better environment, how do we create better environment? If we care about inequality, how do we create less inequality? This is really important because uh, especially those living uh, in the United States uh, are living in a world in which there's a total denial of the value of research and the value of knowledge and uh, that people can make alternative facts, you can just make it out of whole cloth. And what this is uh, reflecting, a global belief that that's not true, that research does make a difference, that we can achieve better whatever our goals are if we develop metrics and then try to figure out how those metrics are related to policy. And that's uh, one of the themes, particularly of this year's uh, conference, is how do we go from these metrics into policy? And the third point I want to mention just very briefly, the original commission said that you can't summarize anything as complex and important as, <coughs> our, econ our, as our society in a single number. And that's why we said you needed a dashboard. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals had 270. That was clearly too many. We said you needed a small number. But what we had hoped would be that in each country, there would be a democratic dialogue about what are the things that ought to go into the dashboard. So, we thought very much that this whole exercise was part of strengthening democracy, that that process of, of developing the dashboard would help societies come together and think about what it was that was uh, important. Uh, and it was clear that GDP did not incorporate all the things uh, that were important. So let me just mention uh, one area, one topic that, that I was particularly engaged in, and that is uh, the issue of how the metrics affected, might have affected, if we had better metrics, how we responded to the 2008 global financial crisis and the 2010 euro crisis. Uh, and here, the idea is a very simple one. Because we didn't fully grasp the impact of what those crises were doing in terms of the wealth, our human capital, uh, our uh, 
experience, our trust, you might call it our social capital, the trust in our institutions. The fact that many governments didn't do as much as they could have done to combat that great recession uh, has left a scar on many of our societies, a scar uh, which we are, the consequences of which we are now experiencing. Uh, our belief and our hope is that if we had had better measures which were, would show that by not addressing these, uh, the economic downturn, even if it, addressing it meant debt would go up, uh, the consequences of not addressing it in terms of the deterioration of our, of our assets, our wealth, our natural capital, our human capital, our social capital, uh, means that we, we made a fundamental mistake. And that illustrates uh, how better metrics might have led to better policies. So let me stop there and, and turn it over to Jean-Paul. <coughs> Thank you, Drew. <coughs> I hope the echo has disappeared. No. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. It's worse up here. Okay. No, we uh, um, began uh, this uh, work, uh, the first uh, <laughs> work of the commission and then the work of the high level expert group out of intellectual curiosity, intellectual interest. What was striking is that all the people we asked did say yes. They were attracted by the newness of the subject and by the, its interest and its import in terms of uh, economic policy. And uh, <laughs> Uh, we uh, were uh, working on the assumption that uh, people can't live without at least the hope of social progress. <coughs> Not only to make uh, <coughs> people first, uh, to make people first without necessarily making American first. <laughs> and uh, uh, <coughs> what we did is what we scrutinized uh, uh, the available metrics to determine how and why they might hide regression. They, uh, <coughs> like um, sustainability, unsustainability, inequalities, including inequalities of opportunities. Uh, <coughs> like uh, 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 mobilities, intertemporal mobilities, <coughs> and uh, uh, the central question we want to ask is, well, if we want to go beyond GDP, that means that we want to answer the question, the growth of what and for whom? <coughs> At the end of the study, uh, I got, uh, and I think uh, uh, that's uh, widely shared, the uncomfortable feeling that hope has disappeared uh, <coughs> from l large part of the world, at least. And now we are <laughs> uh, equipped with a set of data, and the data w which are uh, readily available, on which the society does not recognize itself. So they think that um, the politicians are lying to them. And uh, we were <laughs> working hard to understand why it was so. And the answer was obvious. There was uh, two states of nature. We went from one to another, the first state of nature, one, one of convergence. And um, <coughs> actually, we were going toward uh, a new kind of uh, 
equality, relative inequality, <coughs> and the second state of nature was a state of divergence. In a state of convergence, average have a sense. In a state of divergence, average have no sense. Nobody would recognize itself in an average. And uh, uh, that means that the rate of growth of GDP has no meaning. Why should I care about the rate of growth if I know that it does not profit the majority of the population? So um, what did happen during this period until now is that it is not benefiting to the majority of the population. So that means that the evolution we are knowing now is a regressive evolution as far as social progress is concerned because of uh, this divergence uh, <laughs> toward um, a plurality of destiny that the member of a society uh, may have. And uh, we have also tried to understand uh, this uh, thing looking at <coughs> the uh, basic determinant of well-being. And Drew spoke of one like economic insecurity, which is a fundamental one. It is a fundamental one, and when we look at it, we are struck by one thing, is that insecurity is increasing just because fact, sheer fact, you have more unemployment, you have more precariousness, you have less insurance, but it's not all. The insecurity is increasing also as a consequence of policies. Policies which are <laughs> advocated almost everywhere in Europe, for example, are policy against security. I mean, flexibility, uh, decrease in unemployment benefits. So they are policy which make the assumption that it exists over possibility of having insurance uh, I'll, uh, and then we know that it, it does not. The third point which is important is for the design of policy. So the design of policy geared to, toward the market, flexibility, uh, <coughs> the lack of insurance and so on and so forth, are faulty. If we look at the policy design toward macroeconomics, say what uh, the Europe, Europe is considering as the neck plus ultra of uh, uh, <laughs> sustainability, the sustainability of public debt. And if we think a bit, we understand that the sustainability of public debt has no meaning. Because what has a meaning is the sustainability of the wealth of nation. If the wealth decreasing or increasing. If the wealth is decreasing, then the next generation would not have the same chance as we had. If uh, <coughs> the wealth is increasing, so we have not to worry about. But having this partial view of sustainability, what uh, the uh, <coughs> Europe did is austerity policies. Austerity policies which mean that a reduction of public debt at the expenses of a reduction of a lot of kind of capitals, most of them are not measured. For example, you can decrease the public debt without realizing that you are decreasing at the same time by 10 points the human capital. That you are decreasing uh, the trust in uh, uh, 
society, in individual, in the others, and above all, but uh, conceiving a society this way, you may destroy the most important asset, even if uh, this asset is intangible, which is democracy. What is happening today is a clear consequence of that. Democracy begins to be destroyed. I mean, I hope it will not be a long-term evolution, but you have a rise of authoritarian regime, you have a rise of illiberal democracy, you have a rise of extremist party, you have a big problem with democracy. And democracy is the most important intangible asset of the wealth of nation. So it's why I mean that we have a sense of anger. We have a sense of anger because social progress is not with us, because people have seen for the majority their well-being decrease, and because the world is continuing to be richer. So that is something that we can't understand. Thank you. Thank you, Professor and, and co-chairs. We're now going to move to some questions and answers with the media here. And there should be colleagues with microphones for those journalists that like to ask a question. If we have a journalist that would like to ask a question. Yes. Hello. <coughs> <coughs> 그 2009년도에도 비슷한 보고서를 낸 걸로 알고 있는데요. 2009년도에 낸 보고서와 올해 지금 발표한 보고서의 차이점을 꼽는다면 어떤 것을 가장 중요하게 꼽을 수 있을지 알려주시면 감사하겠습니다. Well, I think the main difference is that we went into uh, detail on a number of topics, as I said before, that we couldn't uh, go into detail like the issue of insecurity, uh, uh, the uh, issue of uh, the impact of an economic downturn on the measurement of wealth, uh, uh, education capital, health capital. Uh, there are a few, or a number of other uh, differences. Uh, in that span of 10 years, a, a lot has happened in terms of the progress of economic science and changes in the world. Uh, so uh, one of the changes in the world is uh, the uh, problem of greater recognition of the problem of climate change, uh, the uh, formulation of the SDGs. Uh, and so one of the things is we, want, we, we have one chapter where we, we relate uh, the SDG work to uh, the work uh, that we, uh, uh, the, of the, the work of the uh, high-level expert group. Um, one of the areas in which there's been a lot of progress is uh, the measurement of subjective well-being. That is to say, there's a lot of, a lot of what economists talk about are objective measures, the unemployment rate, uh, uh, GDP, uh, but there are a lot of objective, uh, subjective measures. How, how do you feel? Your sense of insecurity, your sense of well-being. And uh, there's been further progress in uh, the understanding of the, the subjective measures and how they're related to other ideas like trust, what's happening to trust, and insecurity. You want to add, yeah. add anything? Trust. Martin? Perhaps one, um, I mean, there are, in a sense, the, the follow-up from the um, 2009 report, 
was in two parts. One was to look at some issues and progress that had been made in some issues and what else needed to be done and a range of new issues that were not covered in the 2009 Commission. And in the first part, I, I think that there is a lot in this new report on how to better measure inequalities, as you said, uh, Joe. We take stock of the fact that there, there have been a lot of improvements, um, but there's still a lot of major issues that need to be solved to better understand inequalities. Uh, not only income and wealth inequalities, but also there is a whole a range of issues about inequalities of opportunity, uh, but also inequalities within the household, the difference between men and women, who owns um, the assets, who takes decisions within the household. So it goes further in how to measure um, inequalities, and in particular as well, there is a, a discussion on how to better integrate survey measures of inequalities with, uh, the, um, national, within the national accounts so that we have a better understanding of uh, distributions within um, national account measures. So there, there's a whole range of issues around inequalities that I think I, I've, um, are discussed in, in much more uh, details in, uh, in this report compared to the 2009 report. Um, in addition to this new uh, topic such as economic insecurity, such as trust, uh, and further discussions of subjective well-being. Yeah, uh, I am totally in, in agreement. Uh, I want to just to underline <coughs> the point is that in this report, we were able to show that some subjective measure had a real effect on some objective measure, mm. <laughs> like uh, subjective well-being, uh, or it may be a predictor of what will happen in the future, and also like trust, how it will be a predictor of uh, uh, what can, may happen in, in the future. And that, I think, are really nice results. And just uh, let me add one more thing, which is <coughs> we view this as, as, as an ongoing process, mm -hmm. uh, and that as our work proceeded, there were some new topics that we opened up that we weren't able to go into that we that we hope researchers will go, go into. So two examples of that are uh, concepts like resilience, uh, the ability of, a, of, of a, a system to recover when it's uh, 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 confronted with a shock, and vulnerability, what is the chance uh, of somebody uh, falling below a given threshold. One important aspect perhaps we could say is that um, <coughs> When you look at, um, I'm following up on your point on, Joe, on vulnerability um, and linked to objective measures of uh, insecurity, um, the, uh, the work by Professor Jacob Hecker, which is actually just in front of me, uh, shows that um, the, uh, in, in countries over the period from 1990, around 1992 now, up to now, in many countries, the, uh, the, the, uh, on average, um, a lot of people have seen their income actually drop by 25% uh, or more. And in, in some countries, it's even much larger than that, or almost up to, um, to 50%. So once people have this shock, uh, income shock, uh, and if you look in parallel to that, what, is, what are the buffers to actually um, help them when they face this sort of shocks? We've made some calculations based on our um, wealth data. It shows that while a number of people, like about 10, 15% of people can be said of being in poverty in OECD countries on average, actually that more than 40% of the people on average in the OECD do <coughs> not have three months of income in front of them. To, to be able to actually um, su you know, support their lives in case of a, of a major income shock, which is not something that is sort of um, unusual. It happens often. So by combining uh, income and wealth inequalities and look at the joint distribution, 
we can, we can have better measures of vulnerability, which is something that we emphasize should be um, done more in, um, in, um, in terms of the type of information that statistical offices should collect, which is a joint distribution of income, consumption, and wealth, so that you really have a more objective measure of vulnerability and hence of the buffers that need to be put in place to address these sort of shocks. And just one more little point, which is uh, Jacob uh, is a political scientist, and like our earlier commission, we try to be multidisciplinary. Yes. But this uh, group had the further advantage. We had several uh, <coughs> people who were national statisticians. And so we, we did a bigger effort of trying to combine, uh, to, to, to make sure our work was translatable into the way that it could be used by national statistical offices. And just w uh, a word, because I see Francois Bourguignon in front of me. <laughs> he, he has made a splendid chapter on the equality of opportunity. And uh, this chapter on the equality of opportunity is also linked to what uh, uh, Alan Kroger did on the Great Gatsby Curve. It is the way uh, of uh, uh, <laughs> real inequality to transform inequality of uh, opportunity and vice versa, so as to, uh, <coughs> to freeze the uh, uh, mobility, uh, the generational mobility in, in the society, which is terrible. I'm sorry. Uh, I see. We, I think we have a speaker who seems very keen to ask a question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, gentlemen, I wanted to ask you a, a question regarding the financial crisis, which is what, how you opened your interventions. And the question is, do you think that the responses that we had to the financial crisis and the problems that you illustrated were due to the fact that we had insufficient or not good quality information and data? Or were they something to do with the objectives that we set ourselves in response to respond to that crisis? Because that matters obviously to the people here that are collecting and producing better and better data all the time. Did we not have enough data to know that inequality was a problem in 2008? Not enough to avoid increasing it by some of the, rep the, the policies that we implemented. And I should say, I live in Portugal and I am Italian, so I have both perspectives of what happened. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, we had a lot of data, and the data that we had uh, should have sufficed to give us a warning about the many ways in which our policies were inadequate. You're absolutely right. But I think our belief was that if we had had even more data and we could have shown that it was really foolish to focus, say, on the level of the debt when the result of uh, not stimulating the economy was that you were destroying assets, human capital, uh, as either in terms of on-the-job skills, uh, health, uh, you know, in some countries, the deterioration in the health. We, we have data we, we discussed in, in, in the report about how trust was eviscerated, and that, that goes to the, the nature of the functioning of our society and our democracy. These issues were not as much on the table as I think they uh, could have been. So whether whether this would have tilted the balance, I can't s say, but I, I really do think that we would have had a much better fulsome discussion if we had been more aware of the many different dimensions and we had metrics on these very many di di dimensions. One other example that might illustrate, uh, um, QE was celebrated as uh, stimulating the economy. There's some evidence about whether it did or not, but let's put that aside. But we also now know that QE, uh, quantitative easing, led to a vast increase in wealth inequality. And if you had been more aware of this 
effect in increasing wealth inequality, you might still have gone ahead with quantitative easing, but you might have thought maybe we ought to have some more capital gains taxation, maybe we ought to have other measures to counterbalance. Yes, we need to stimulate our economy, but there, are, you know, in terms of this medicine, if you want to think of it that way, this medicine has some very noxious side effects. And if we know that there are these side effects, maybe we could do something uh, to address them. Yeah. Uh, there is something more uh, pedestrian than that, uh, which is that we knew about inequality. I remember that I have written a book on 1995 with Pierre Rosan Vallon on the subject. And, uh, but uh, we uh, and Joe have done a lot of work, uh, and Martin too. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, for example, we were uh, blind. We did not even look at the <coughs> private debt. We looked at the public debt, but not even at the private debt. And we know that the, the problem came from the private debt not from the public debt. So we, that means that uh, until now, we have not a general macroeconomic model, including the financial sector, in a satisfactory way. We should develop this kind of model if we want to be able to answer completely your question. There's a gentleman there. Someone could bring him a microphone. And then we have time for one more question. Thank you. I am a Korean economist, Su Gilian, of some vintage. I have two very quick questions. First, if there is a country which pursues promotion of well-being based upon your recommendations, would that be a politically winning strategy? Mm -hmm. To illustrate my question, with, uh, uh, I look at, I am a casual observer of uh, French politics, and my understanding is that President Macron has been more or less uh, pursuing policies in line with this set of uh, re your, your recommendations, whereas his popularity is hitting the bottom. How would you explain that? And secondly, we know that the uh, UN summit has launched the SDGs, and all the national governments have pledged to pursue them. Would the pursuit of SDGs, that 17 SDGs, and the consequent targets and indicators, would that amount to the pursuit of well-being? Yeah, for Macron. <laughs> <laughs> For Macron, I can tell you that uh, Macron did not at all follow our <laughs> recommendation, but not at all. <laughs> he did exactly the converse. <laughs> what he did, he took the money in the pocket of the poor and he gave the money to the rich. That is a caricatural way of saying it, <laughs> a less caricatural way of saying it is to say that he decreased the tax on wealth and it increases the tax on pensions, which is the same. And uh, you understand why he is so low in the uh, pools, because <coughs> it is considering as having a policy which mm, only can increase inequality, not reduce inequality, but increase inequality. So let me uh, give you uh, one other aspect that, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the reforms that he has pursued over a long time is labor market reform. And uh, during the campaign, he said uh, that he was going to do a Nordic style labor market reform where uh, where they have what's called flex security, that you increase the flexibility of the labor market, 
But at the same time, you shift the burden to uh, the state of uh, ensuring that there's security for workers. But it, it didn't happen. He did the first part, which is uh, uh, the insecurity part, but he didn't do the second part, which was the, the security uh, part. Now, on the other question, on uh, the, the SDGs, um, Ravi uh, Kambur uh, led uh, a chapter that was written in, in this book uh, on, on, on that topic. Uh, one of the problems with the SDGs was it was a political uh, uh, process, and everybody uh, wanted to uh, have their favorite topic. By the way, that was testimony to how influential the Millennium Development Goals have been. That global community getting together and in a process of norm setting actually affects behavior. And I think you should view the SDGs as part of norm setting. And I think it is an important part. But then the question is, going beyond that, for any country, particularly a developing country, they can't assess uh, what is going on in terms of 270 some goals, uh, metrics, and, and 140. What? Uh, <laughs> okay. But there are too many. And one of the things that, that that chapter points out is that you have to narrow it down, that in each country they'll have to make a decision. But for instance, in most African countries, employment is going to be really important. It's important both for equality, for security, but it, it is a, it's just part of the a core national uh, goal. Uh, but as I say, every country will need to choose among the many goals, the ones that are most salient for it at that particular time. I think for most countries today, <coughs> the environment will have to be one of the goals that they, one, one of the elements of the dashboard that you want to focus on because uh, the magnitude of the environmental degradation and what it is, ha what the impact it is ha that it is having on well-being uh, is uh, can't be ignored. And finally, let, let me say, I, I mentioned New Zealand as a country where the government explicitly is bringing in well-being. Uh, Scotland is another country where they're uh, bringing well-being in explicitly into the national policy framework. And I think it's been very uh, successful in these uh, countries because people can relate more to the notion of well-being. They can see how resources are being allocated in ways that affect their well-being. And that is much more germane than, some abs uh, than just dollars where they're not sure where those dollars are going. Uh, may I just, uh, I'd, I'd like I think your question is, is it um, politically, is it a winning um, strategy, a politically winning strategy? Um, to be, I mean, Joe just mentioned the example of New Zealand, the ex example of Scotland. There are a few other countries. Slovenia is already, has also gone in that direction. And there are a few other countries that are going in that direction. But it's fair to say that we don't have that many examples of countries which have actually set up as well-being as the ultimate objective of their political agenda. So we're watching out what's happening uh, in these countries very carefully. And the well-being budget for 2019 in New Zealand will be a very good example of how well-being is actually being um, used as a, the objective under which all um, political um, interventions and policy reforms will be judged against. So we will see how it develops, and Scotland is another example where we are looking at it. So I think it's, uh, to be fair, it's a bit too early to say, uh, because what you mentioned about France, I mean, President Macron, perhaps I wouldn't be as negative <laughs> as uh, Joe, sorry, we're not on the same, uh, um, uh, um, prop maybe uh, I would not go as far, but he never <laughs> said, it, it was not, it was never um, kind of, you know, I'm going to, my, my platform is to, inc to improve the well-being of people, and I am going to change the machinery of government so that, to, so that when we make a decision, I'm going to use, to look at ex ante and ex post, 
what the impact of my intervention and my policies is doing on the well-being of people based on the set of, set of predefined indicators that would have been chosen, as Joe said, but through a democratic process. This is a very major change in the way you conduct policies, and very few governments have actually gone that far. So New Zealand, Scotland, a few others, Slovenia perhaps are some examples. So we are following up what they do, and we'll tell you if these governments are re-elected in the next election, because that's a test, and whether it will be politically uh, winning. Um, but it has the, the, um, the um, pre I mean, this strategy has uh, really the pretension to um, put well-being at the center, and, um, and in May, we, uh, we'll see whether it's politically winning. The second question on the SDGs, I think, as Joe said, it's a very complex, very political agenda, but it is indeed an agenda that is, um, you know, leaving no one behind um, and improving the planet, uh, because, you know, there are five Ps, peace, um, planet, prosperity, uh, people, and I don't know what, and partnership are the five Ps. <laughs> so potentially, um, it's very well aligned with the, with the well-being agenda, and all um, member countries of the U United Nations have signed up to it. So it may be too idealistic to think that this is going to transfer and always be a, a winning, um, a politically winning strategy, but at least it shows how far the Beyond GDP agenda has gone, and I think it's a good example of a, a really strong international political agenda that shows <coughs> that it's gone beyond GDP. Now, how you implement it in um, specifically and concretely in the countries, I think we all agree, and there's a chapter by Ravi Campbell that says, indeed, you have to tailor it to the uh, priorities of your own uh, country because it's an overwhelming agenda. Otherwise, you cannot work on, you know, uh, in parallel on 17 uh, objectives, 169 targets, and 240 indicators. I want to uh, rebound one second on what uh, Martin said. Uh, about Macron. <laughs> Macron did this policy because he had in mind a theory, which is a trickle-down theory. And what did happen is that he, he, he did trickle-down <laughs> at the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so people have seen it. They, they can't uh, be blind. So they have seen it, and trickle down did not happen. <coughs> uh, I see that there are several participants keen to ask questions, but Martine and the professors are here for the next three days, so if I can encourage them to talk to them outside of this session. We have yeah. a journalist to ask the last question here, if a person with a microphone there. That would be great. And then that will be the last question, I'm afraid. Hi,안녕하세요.이데일리김정현기자입니다.저는한국에관해서질문드리고싶은데요.그주관적인측면에서본경제지표에대해서이야기하셨는데그런측면에서한국을어떻게평가하는지그리고해줄만한조언이있으
uh, some of the particular other issues that are uh, of concern in uh, uh, Korea and in other countries around the world. Um, one of the uh, um, particular problems in Korea is that uh, a large fra fraction of women uh, are not in the workplace. They're highly educated, but they stay at home. And that often gives rise to uh, a sense of isolation. And one of the themes that we brought out in our book, both in our earlier study and this one, is the role of, of connectedness. Uh, Bob Putnam was in our original commission, yeah. and it, he often emphasized the importance of connectedness and loneliness. Uh, and uh, this becomes something that one, as one thinks about structuring a society, uh, that becomes important. And one of the interesting, just as, a, as an anecdote, um, Martine emphasized that what's really important is that government take these, uh, the well-being approach as part of the basic government framework. <coughs> In one country, they, <coughs> they were uh, making decisions about shutting down post offices in villages. From a pure commercial point of view, it makes sense. But the post office was a place, the only place in some villages where people, <coughs> got, where people got together. And so the post office played an important role in a sense of connectedness. And in this particular case, the deliberations were that shutting down the post office would have an adverse effect on the well-being of the community and the village, and the decision was not to shut uh, the post office down. But uh, to come back to Korea, there are issues about, in, in, in all our countries, about the role of uh, the new technology, social media, what is it doing to young people in terms of anxiety, in terms of, of attention span and stress. And, you know, it's not a particularly Korean issue, but it's an issue that in the 21st century, it's not a, we didn't have to deal with this issue 50 years ago, yeah. but it is an issue that if we were to do another report, I think it would be an issue that would be on, on our agenda. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps, perhaps I can add something about Korea. Um, Korea, according to our um, uh, statistics um, in the Better Life Index, is um, a can the country that has one of the lowest <coughs> levels of subjective well-being across OECD countries, and also one of the lowest level of trust, uh, trust in institutions in particular. Um, and um, uh, it's always difficult, we haven't probably done the analysis on to understand what are the determinants for trust, trust in institutions. The, our studies show that there is a great link um, between um, government integrity, corruption, and of course the level of trust in institutions. But in terms of the um, subjective well-being, as Joe said, there's really something for Korea that is different from other OECD countries perhaps. In Korea, that's the place where uh, people work the longest hours uh, compared to other countries by far. Uh, and that means that um, people work very long hours, often women, because if they want to have um, uh, children, if the family wants to have children, uh, women have to drop out of the labor market, so they do not participate. The, this participation rate of women is one of the lowest. Uh, of women is the lowest in the, in the OECD. Um, and, um, and there is a very bad quality of work-life balance in Korea. So the sense of isolation, the fact that women do not participate in, in the labor market, the fact that there are unsocial working hours in Korea, in addition to which you also have uh, the fact that it, uh, for children, education system, the education system is extremely competitive. Children go to after, uh, after class, um, um, uh, schools and they have extra hours. So that means that the family is not often uh, together. Uh, the father being at work for long hours, the mother staying at, uh, in, I'm, I'm just caricaturing, and the children uh, having long hours at school. So there is here 
something that perhaps is one um, subject for exploration to see whether that affects the subjective well-being of uh, this low subjective well-being, um, can explain the low subjective uh, well-being of people um, in Korea. Certainly the work-life balance is an issue that um, we should be looking at. Actually at the OECD we conducted a study on family policies and have encouraged childcare policy, for instance, so that we more childcare policy, which is, by the way, something that the uh, uh, present moon is actually uh, promoting and tries to promote to address this. In even legislating about um, long working hours is also something that is being considered by this government and would, um, of course, the OECD would support as a policy. I think we can yeah. have a, one last quick in one word. One, word. One short question. <laughs> uh, she's yeah, uh, I'm Jennifer Chan from Press TV. How does launching the high-level expert group report today at this forum uh, improve upon previous reports like the Stiglitz Sen Fujitsu report and OECD House Life report in addressing the problems we've been talking about? Uh, you know, that GDP is not enough. Uh, as we've already uh, said, I think it shows that that agenda is a very robust agenda. It's resonated and uh, it's going to take a lot of work to put it fully into practice. Uh, we're very pleased that so many governments are actually beginning to try to do that. Uh, but the basic idea that Governments ought to focus on what makes makes people uh, the well-being of society, well-being of individuals individually, but also collectively, and uh, how policy can uh, promote well-being, uh, and how measurement can help us understand our success in that endeavor uh, is uh, the central message of our new report. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz, and thanks everyone for a very interesting uh, he wants discussion. To say two words. I wanted to, to make a point which is linked to the interconnectedness because we have a big example now. Our policies have a long term effect and may be revealed for because uh, uh, by chance. You had uh, in France this uh, movement which is called the Yellow Jacket Movement. <laughs> the Yellow Jacket Movement uh, came from the fact that connectedness was reduced in the country. Lots. Coffee <coughs> was closed, uh, uh, um, uh, baker were closed, uh, uh, <coughs> post office were closed. So people had only their cars <laughs> to, to make the things. And what did happen is that the government decided to increase the taxes on oil. Gasoline. And this has led to a kind of revolution in, uh, in, in France because people did not accept that. You reduce connectedness and then you make us pay the full bill. That's not uh, right. Just that. <laughs> and on that note, we really are going to have to finish. I just <laughs> remind everyone the next session is on a topic that was came up very often in the first panel this morning on digitalization with Julia Hobsbawm at 2.30. So I encourage you to attend that. Thanks, everyone. Yes, and another big thank you to our moderator as well as our three speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. 네, 감사합니다. 이것으로 기자회견을 모두 마치도록 하겠습니다. 식사를 아직 못 하신 분들께서는 저희 로비에서 안내 요원들의 안내를 받으시길 바랍니다. 그리고 저희 스피커와 VIP 분들께서는 2층 프리미어 볼룸으로 가셔서 식사를 하시면 될것 같습니다. 그리고 소지품은 꼭 가지고 이동을 해 주시길 바랍니다. 
Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have still not had lunch, please follow the guidance of our staff who are waiting for you in the lobby. And for our speakers and our VIPs, please move over to the premier ballroom on the second floor, and you will be able to still have your lunch over there. And uh, to avoid any damage or any loss, please remember to take your belongings with you uh, so that you do not have any losses. Uh, we will also have our next session beginning here at 2.30 p.m., so we also ask for your attention as well. Please enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you back here at 2.30. Thank you very much. 감사합니다.